Okay, let me make sure it goes live on Facebook. Just, just, just give me a second. Okay. <clears throat> I'd rather not have my pair of socks have YouTube immortality. <laughs> there was a pair of socks on the books. So, so. Anyway, okay, great. Ready to... Okay. All right. Shall I share screen then or take over? Yeah. Uh, not yet. I'll I'll announce the talk. Okay. Then okay. You tell me. You tell me what to do. Okay, so I guess we are live now. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at Oxford University Quantum Information Society. This term, we had two events so far. There were three flash talks in the first event. And last week, we had a talk on fault tolerant quantum computing. This week, we have two talks. The first one is today. And the second one is uh, on Thursday, I guess. And it's about ZX calculus. Today, our uh, distinguished speaker is Professor Simon Saunders. Uh, he is one of the uh, leading proponents of the Averettian picture of quantum mechanics or the, the many worlds interpretation. Uh, he's a professor of philosophy of physics at the University of Oxford. He's a tutorial fellow at Merton College. And today, he's going to talk about uh, how to make sense of probabilities in the many worlds picture of quantum mechanics. Uh, now I would like to request Simon to share his screen and uh, let us hear from him. After the talk, we'll have a 15 minute Q&A so you can ask questions in the chat. Over to you, Simon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hamza, and thank you for your invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to talk to your group. Um, so yes, as you say, probability, well, I have a long title now, probability is branch counting. Sorry, yes, Simon, rules. Simon, could you go uh, uh, full screen, please? Uh, full screen, okay. Is, is that a bit better? A bit better, but if there should be a present option. If you click on I'd, slides. I'd rather, I'd rather not if that's okay. Um, okay, okay. No so I, I know what slides are coming and I can see what I'm doing. So forgive okay. me. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let me start off with, in a way, the um, our situation in Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, what one might call the devil's pitchfork, uh, because we have three well worked out uh, forms of realism about quantum mechanics. Um, but each of them is very problematic in different ways. One of them is by introducing hidden variables. Uh, another is by modifying the Schrodinger equation to dynamical collapse. Um, and a third is the many worlds interpretation or the Everett interpretation. Um, and that's the one that I'll be talking about today. The, the first to give a, how to put it, conservative picture of reality uh, the Everett interpretation is provides a radical interpretation of reality as fundamentally different from how we ordinarily think it to be. Um, and of course, Many Worlds gives it away. Um, but let me just introduce a couple of books that I, I think would be highly uh, make for wonderful reading. Um, so one is this book by Peter Byrne, um, which is about Everett the man, and it's a fascinating story. Um, on the uh, next to it is a book called Many Worlds, question um, mark. And this was um, a compilation of writings and also transcripts of discussions um, that were made for or followed on uh, a conference celebrating the 50th anniversary of Everett's ideas in the first publication, which was in 1957. Um, this book is far and away the best book on the Everett interpretation. Um, I, sorry if that comes over as rather dogmatic, but I, I believe it to be so. Uh, written by David Wallace, The Emergent Multiverse, published in 2012. Um, and uh, I think I agree with every single word in it. Uh, well, uh, anyways, there's some, perhaps a few equi equivocations, uh, but David and I worked together on the Many Worlds interpretation over a very long period of time. 
Right, so um, let me just list the pros and cons. Uh, I've already hinted at it. Pros of many worlds preserves quantum mechanics intact. Of course, if you're looking to change quantum mechanics, that's not a pro at all. And one might be drawn and attracted to dynamical collapse because one's going to do new physics and so on and so forth. I absolutely applaud and approve of, of such a view and, and would wish more physicists to pursue it, um, just to try and see what can be what can be done, but physicists, for the most part, are reluctant to work outside of standard quantum mechanics. So I see it as my job, in particular, in a philosophy, um, working as a philosopher. I should try to work on philosophy, really, to understand what the physics may be telling us, rather than try to change the physics. I don't see that as my skill set, if you like. Um, so um, it preserves quantum mechanics intact. Uh, that's very much what I, as a philosopher, wish to do. I wish to learn from quantum theory. It's now 100 years old, not a single flaw, or any hint of a conflict with experiment. It's shown extraordinary resilience, robustness, fecundity, accuracy, generality. I mean, it, you, it, there's all of those words apply. So we've never seen a, a theory like it, I think, in the history of physics. Um, it provides a realist interpretation. Now, People divide on realism, and there are many physicists who are tentative as to the whole question of realism, but I think that's very largely a reflection of just how problematic ordinary quantum mechanics is from a realist point of view, uh, and in particular uh, in presenting the measurement problem, an apparent conflict between the Schrodinger equation or the unitary equations of quantum theory uh, and the appearance of uh, randomness and indeterminateness in the laboratory. Wave packet collapse, the quantum jump, call it what you will. Uh, I mean, the measurement problem is, is no more than that. Um, it's only called a measurement problem because it's precisely in dealing with measurements um, that one, as it were, mathematically, if you're going to model the measurement, um, have to grapple with the issue. Um, and that's where uh, one sees most vividly the nature of the difficulty on a realist approach. Of course, if the quantum state um, is nothing to do with reality or it doesn't describe a reality and it's more or less a compendium of our beliefs about the results of experiments and so on and so forth, then uh, the, the measurement problem is it still remains, but it's, very, it's tractable in ways that for a realist it is not. Um, I'd add there's no non-locality in Bell's sense, um, whether that's a very precious thing to uh, restore locality may differ, people may have different views, but it signals a fundamental um, compatibility of the Everett interpretation with relativity. Um, and that's not true of pilot wave theory or dynamical collapse theory. It explains what probability is, if you can accept that explanation, of course explains why personal probabilities should conform to physical probabilities. So personal probabilities are bound up with subjective degrees of belief. Um, and uh, different people will have different beliefs in the face of physical states of affairs. Um, but there's a general tenant, and it seems to be what we're required to do, that if we're told what the objective probabilities are, something out there in the world, then we should conform our subjective degrees of belief to match it. That's roughly the idea. Now, for most people, and many people, I think, in physics, for most physicists, I think, ascribe to some version of frequentism and typically naive frequentism, whereby probabilities are just frequencies out there in the world. And such people see no difficulty in conforming their subjective degrees of belief or how they should gamble or bet on the basis of the actual frequencies. You know, you throw a dice a hundred times and you, you get uh, a six roughly, uh, roughly 18 times. Uh, so uh, you think you throw it again, your chances is one in six. So there's a fairly straightforward and simple minded way of understanding this last one. Um, but it becomes difficult when actually the, whatever the physical probabilities are, when they're not actual frequencies. If for example, it's a physical quantity such as amplitude or squared amplitude. Now, why should I conform my subjective degrees of belief to that? And I think then you get to feel a bit of the philosophical um, push of this, of this question. Uh, a lot of philosophy of probability is bound up with this, 
this issue. Although in philosophy, mostly people don't know what physical probability is because most philosophers don't do quantum theory. And even if they did, it's not clear what physical probability exactly is. And it takes us back to questions of realism and the measurement problem. Okay, so in a way, this whole talk is about how to recover naive frequentism in the Everett interpretation. So that's one way of putting what I'll be about. But first, let me just talk about the cons of the Everett interpretation. Number one, ontological extravagance. It implies there is a vast multiplicity of universes. So that's absolutely extraordinary and astonishing and in a way leaves people unable to know how one ought to reason about something like that. What really can that mean? Is it remotely believable uh, and so forth. Um, my own attitude to this is I, I focus on the question, does quantum mechanics, is it interpretable in this way with all of these pros or not? And the question whether there really is a great multiplicity of universes, I think is then the question, well, is quantum mechanics true? And I, I don't know whether quantum mechanics is true. So, I mean, that's my own way of, as it were, finessing what philosophers sometimes call the incredulous stare. You know what, you take this stuff seriously. But of course, the reason to take it seriously is if we're not putting it in by hand, if it really does follow from quantum mechanics on a realist understanding of it. Uh, and that mostly means taking the Schrodinger equation to hold without exception, to apply to whatever, including macroscopic bodies. Uh, and that the state is something represents something real. Anyway, so the one, but for the con it can't be denied that the, the incredibleness of the of the interpretation is is problematic. Um, and another con is there remains a question mark over probability. <clears throat> so again, that's what this um, this talk is all about. Um, now, for those who don't know anything about uh, many worlds, I. I <laughs> I, I, I will struggle to um, give you enough um, information, but can I just give you an image for the moment that whatever it pointed to in the formalism, if you take the Schrodinger equation to apply without restriction, and in particular to a measurement process, um, he arrived at a, a picture and an image of a tree, a branching tree, where the branches never reconverge, much like in real trees. Um, and uh, just to relate it a bit better to the physics, where the vertical direction is um, the forward direction in time. And so these branches are always branching upwards. They, they don't go back downwards. That would be time reversal. OK, so, so this is the structure of the quantum state, according to Everett, on the basis of the simple models of, of measurements that he provided. Um, and this talk is about a particular way of understanding this branching tree in terms of counting branches. There's some ambiguity about what is branch referring to now. Is it is it the, the time-like extended thing, or is it a, a cut, a slice through one of these branches? Um, but, well, if physicists who are thoughtful about such things will know one can ask the same question about everyday objects. Should everyday objects be understood as 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 uh, time as as time like lines, you know, structured time like lines in a four dimensional space time, or should we imagine an object, a physical object, as an instantaneous thing? So this sort of consideration does arise in the Everett interpretation in ways that it doesn't in pilot wave theory or uh, dynamical collapse theories, um, and I think though that points to the compatibility of the Everett interpretation with relativity and the four dimensional perspective one does need to go back and forth between three and four dimensional perspectives. Anyway, given all of that, what is the branch counting rule? Well, simplify, you've just got a quantum experiment. So it's a quantum flip, heads or tails, and you count the number of branches. There's one of each, fine. And if you imagine repeating the flipping on every branch after you've flipped, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again. So, uh, you know, you do it uh, eight times or something and you've got something like 64 branches different ways of, you start at the top, there's a unique way of going back down to the bottom, count the numbers right at the top, and that's the number of branches. And if you're flipping coins, you, when you trace each one back, you can see how many heads were there, how many tails were there. And then you can say that the probabilities should be given by the number of branches, which for a given relative frequency of heads and tails, the probability for that is given by the number of branches with that relative frequency of heads and tails. 
And that sounds entirely straightforward, intuitively easy to understand, uh, plausible, compelling even. Except guess what? What happens when the probability for getting a tail is different from the probability of getting a head? What happens when it's not a fair coin? What happens if the coin is so loaded that nine out of 10 times it's going to land heads? Now in quantum mechanics, that will reflect through into a difference in the amplitude, in fact, the squared amplitudes of the components for getting a heads and a tails. We'll be looking at some of these simple formal models in a moment. But vary those amplitudes, you don't vary those relative frequencies are given by branch counting at all. They're totally independent of the amplitudes, so long as the amplitudes are non-zero. So this branch counting rule, intuitive, compelling even, spells real trouble for the Everett interpretation. It's in conflict with the Born rule. Okay, so you might think, goodness, if things are so bad as that, then how come the Everett interpretation is even still worth talking about? And the answer is, things are not so straightforward. You can point out that this branch counting rule that seems so intuitive and self-evident is actually inherently contradictory. So here's a way of seeing that. Do a second flip of the coin, but only on the heads up branch, not on the tails branch. So you start off, what's the probability that you'll have, and, and the second flip, actually it's about something else altogether. You're, you're measuring spin or something. It doesn't affect whether you've got a head. So for the second flip, you, you've still got the heads result. So what's the probability of heads? After the first flip, it was presumably 50-50, one branch of each. After you do the second flip, some other measurement, but splitting again into two, now there's two branches with heads and only one with tails. So now the probability of heads is two thirds. So which is it, one half or two thirds? And what that's showing is that this branch counting rule, you know, intuitive though it may seem, is, is just in, inherently, um, in, well, incoherent is one way of putting it. Um, I, I just should, sorry, I ought to have get flipped on a slide or two. Um, but I want to distinguish two kinds of branch counting here. One is what I call global branch counting. I've got that in red. Uh, count the number of branches at any time. And that's the one that we just saw led to uh, an instability in what the probabilities really were. Is it a half or is it two thirds? And now in green, I've got local count branch counting. Just count the number of branches at a branching event. Okay, and now I'm putting the probabilities for those two cases. On each flip, you you the, the, what is produced uh, the half the, the the branch with a half after one toss of the coin uh, splits again into two worlds. They now ha each have probability one quarter. So we're just updating probabilities in the conventional way. <clears throat> All right, and now there's no uh, uh, instability in the probabilities, and this local branch counting rule remains well. Why isn't it intelligible? And more than that. If the world splits into two, how can one of the two worlds produced be more probable than the other or less probable than the other? They both actually happen. Well, here I've got a couple of comments by some well-known figures. Um, the first is by Neil Graham, who was a student of Bryce DeWitt. Um, and this is what he wrote as part of his PhD that he wrote under Bryce DeWitt back in the early 70s. It was on this issue. Um, I won't read it out, it'll take too much time. Um, the other, uh, it, may I say, Graham wasn't trying to bring down the Everett interpretation, as it were. DeWitt was its great supporter. He thought he could correct the branch counting rule. But the trouble is, nobody believed his correction. So all that amounted to sort of bringing attention to just how difficult this problem was. And here's Tim Maudlin, a uh, very influential philosopher of physics and arch critic of the Everett interpretation. Um, which he is damning of it. Well, he says this at the end, in no sense will more of my descendants see the right frequency rather than the wrong one. Just the opposite is true. And he's drawing attention there to the conflict with the Born rule. <clears throat> okay, so let me just say what Everett actually proved just so that you get the other side of it. <laughs> 
I'm not going to be talking about this proof very much, but it's uh, it's a very elegant result. He showed this, that following n measurements, the amplitude of the superposition of all of the states at the end with records of statistics at variance with the Born rule falls off exponentially fast in n in comparison with the amplitude of the superposition of all the states whose recorded statistics conform to the Born rule. Okay, and indeed, as you take the limit, n goes to infinity, the only branches left are those which have statistics conforming to the Born rule. But of course, n goes to infinity is also an infinite time limit, and that never happens. So from a realist point of view, that's not terribly interesting. Okay, so um, to make progress with this, um, I uh, because there's a real impasse here, and in a certain sense, the, re the response of Everettians to to this has to has been to focus on the personal opinion side of it. You know, why should personal degrees of belief, subjective degrees of belief, conform to the squared amplitudes? Forget about the question of whether the squared amplitudes are really probabilities. Okay, and there's been a great deal of debate about it. And the books that I showed you right at the beginning, there's a lot of material on that issue and that strategy as it, as it were. But I'm pursuing a different strategy here. Okay, what we need to do is revisit what Everett actually showed. Uh, so he gave what he called an abstract theory of measurement. Um, so think of a stern gerlach experiment. You've got an atom of silver. It's, it's evaporated from an oven. It's got a spin, um, and it passes through an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And depending on the state of spin, uh, it either receives an impulse uh, in one direction in relation to the magnet or in the opposite direction in relation to the magnet. Subsequent detection of where that silver atom is located is then correlated with the spin of that, as measured spin of that atom spin up, spin down in some component of spin, Z component, for example. Okay, so uh, what I've got here in small lowercase Greek letters is the spin states. So the phi with the little arrows. In capital uh, Greek letters, I've got um, states of the apparatus. But this is a very schematic model where we can really imagine it as just one or two degrees of freedom. Um, and if the measurement process is going to be a good one, it had better conform uh, to these protocols that I've got at the top. Yeah, spin up eigenstate of the silver atom had better be measured as spin up. If it's a spin down state of the silver atom, it had better be measured as spin down. And it's only insofar as you can build an apparatus and there's a, a Schrodinger equation which will drive that evolution that you've got yourself a decent measurement device. Everett further supplemented the thing with a, with a memory, with states, capital chi, uh, subscript S. S is going to be a sequence of arrows, uh, what has been recorded in memory of previous measurements. Um, and then that memory, if it's going to work as it should, had better satisfy these next two protocols. And I hope that's fairly self-explanatory. I've got a reset operation there. Um, oh, I'm not getting the whole of the... Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of things I don't want. Uh, good. Um, can I just move this over a little bit? Right. Um, so I've got a reset of the degree of freedom of the apparatus that records the result. It's like a pointer reading, pointer degree of freedom. So it goes back to capital Phi zero uh, after it's performed a measurement. And what has been measured is now stored in memory. And I hope that's clear from these two protocols here. So now taken together, oh, I don't want to jump yet. Uh, the next two equations give me um, what happens when you've got a spin up silver atom and the whole sequence goes through. And then of course it follows from unitarity, use the Schrodinger equation that when the initial state is a superposition of spin up and spin down, then we get a superposition of the apparatus measuring one state and the apparatus measuring the other state of spin. Okay, and these are the two worlds, these are the two branches, and there's just exactly two of them. But now what I want you to notice is that this number is a discontinuous function of the state. Uh, these A's and B's that control what that initial state is. And the sort of thing I have in mind here is, consider a sequence of initial spin states as shown, 
um, they converge to a spin-up state. Um, I've got this down here, the last mathematical line. The limit of these states is spin-up. Um, but for any finite k, the branch counting rule will give me that there's two branches for any finite k. Strictly take the limit when you've just, just got spin up and you've only got a single branch. So the branch counting rule is discontinuous as a function of the state of spin that we're supposed to be giving an interpretation of in terms of the average interpretation. I mean, I hope that people understand the nature of the the, the dialectic really, it's that um, the branch counting rule is contrary to the Everett, it's contrary to the Born rule, so it's disaster for the Everett interpretation. So it's not acceptable as a critique of the Everett interpretation to come up with a rule that makes no sense at all, right? It had better be a, a rule that does make sense in Everett's own terms, in terms of the very many worlds interpretation. And then if that's disastrous for the Everett interpretation, then you've shown it, it to be internally inconsistent, if you like, or at least that it is hospitable to two quite different notions of probability, which in the eyes of many is reason to be deeply suspicious of the interpretation, including in my eyes. If there's anything to the Everett interpretation, it had better not host two conflicting, each equally, you know, got its pros and cons, interpretations of probability. There's something wrong with the picture, if that's the case. Okay, um, so the branch counting rule had better be a reasonable one, and we've just shown that it's a discontinuous one. What are we going to do with this result? I mean, one sort of move is to say, look, this could be a feature of the idealization that we're using. That's why we're getting this singular behavior. Why don't we look at more realistic models of what's really happening in, in measurements? Okay, and that will promote this sort of thought that we should replace the states for the apparatus measurement, the, the memory and the pointer. Um, don't just have one degree of freedom. There should be macroscopic numbers of degrees of freedom, enormous numbers of degrees of freedom. Um, and allow that in reality, you know, all of these uh, particles, most of them heavy particles, heavy atoms and molecules are well localized in space, not all of them, but on any reasonable realist understanding of what a physical process involving a macroscopic structure is, one had better, it had better make sense that, you know, large molecules or clusters of them be well localized with reasonably well defined velocities, which is not, of course, inconsistent with the Heisenberg uncertainty relationships when the masses are large. So we should allow that in reality, that all of these particles are in well localized states in space. Um, and conclude, therefore, that in a realistic measurement, there will be a vast number of superpositions produced all with for the spin up outcome and a vast number of superpositions produced for the spin down outcome where these molecules are shifted a little bit in relationship uh, to uh, you know their special properties their velocities they collide with one another uh, that, and you get superpositions produced this is how quantum mechanics works so realistically there are going to be this very large number of superpositions. And I've given numbers for them, n with a subscript spin up, uh, an arrow up, and n with a, a, a subscript arrow down. Um, so that's what we'll get, um, these two equations in the case when you've initially got a spin up system and initially you've got a spin down system, a huge superposition produced. And then notice that exactly the same evolutions result on multiplying by complex numbers a and b, won't make any difference. We're talking about the Schrodinger equation. That's all that we have access to is the Schrodinger equation. So the numbers, and this is now the number of branches, the terms in the superposition, right? These numbers will be completely the same when you multiply by A or when you multiply by B. And when you take the superposition of initial states with arbitrary A and B, you've got exactly the same numbers of branches produced, however large, whatever they are, it'll be the same result. And this, of course, assumes that they're all orthogonal to one another, but let's stick with that. So conclude that the same discontinuity results when A or B goes to zero. <clears throat> 
Okay, and observe also that in practice, you know, you might say, what have we learned by going to the more realistic case? Well, we're learning this now in practice. No spin state is of an initial silver atom is in an exact eigenstate of spin, Z component of spin in say the Stan Gerlach experiment. I mean, the, the number of states, spin states on the block sphere is a continuum infinity. To, to talk about an exact Z component of spin eigenstate is to talk, it's like picking a, a, a real number on the surface of a sphere. And in reality, we'll never pick that real number. So conclude that in practice, the branch counting rule is independent of the state altogether. Okay. <clears throat> Um, yeah, sorry, let me not jump to that. <clears throat> so I think what this does um, is in a way show that the branch counting rule really doesn't make sense, especially not on a realistic model of what a measurement process is. But then one thinks, well, goodness, that means branch number really doesn't make any sense. And then you think, well, that seems to mean why, you know, what should branch make any sense? I mean, why would we take seriously this notion of branches or worlds in the evident interpretation if the notion of number makes no sense? Philosophers are used to this sort of thing. I mean, you know, you can take something like uh, regrets, you know, it's clear that you can have many regrets. But if somebody says, well, how many exactly regrets do you have? Uh, and then you think, well, no, that question doesn't make any sense. Or, you know, have you got any holes in your backyard? Yeah, I've got some holes in my backyard. You know, how many holes have you got exactly? And then that's the sort of question that doesn't make any sense. So we've got plenty of examples, you know, or clouds or, you know, how many, how many expressions, you know, <laughs> there's loads of things like that, that that a question of number doesn't really make any sense. But the trouble with that strategy is just for that reason, philosophers conclude that entities like that, holes or clouds or regrets, they're not really proper entities at all. It's just the wrong way to think of them as being entities. Okay, so this works perhaps against the Everett interpretation simply to conclude, well, there just is no meaningful notion of branch number. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm a little worried about time, but I, I, I'll do my best to get through. Um, we really need to rethink as to how to deal with this. And of course, there's loads of experience in physics as to how to deal with just such problems. And I want to draw your attention in particular to um, how Boltzmann dealt with comparable problems or questions in his development of classical statistical mechanics back in the 1870s. <clears throat> and what he did was to introduce a notion, something similar to branch counting, except it was microstate counting on phase space, whereas branch counting is somehow we're trying to count vectors in a superposition. Okay, for Boltzmann, he was trying to count the number of microstates that are accessible to a system, energetically accessible to a system, which is undergoing something like a quasi-ergodic motion or some sort of mixing and so forth. How many microstates, Boltzmann asked. And of course, if you think that a microstate in statistical mechanics, classical statistical mechanics, is just a point in the end particle phase space, then the answer is a continuum infinity of them. So that obviously didn't work. So what Boltzmann did is he, he spoke instead of a fine graining on the one particle face space into microstates of finite size as given by the measure of the one particle face space, Liouville measure. <clears throat> and then asked the question of um, how many such microstates for a given macrostate and then the equilibrium entropy is going to be that macrostate which has the greatest number of microstates. Okay. So that's going to be our clue, and I'm going to come back and use that um, shortly. But um, if we're going to take this over to quantum mechanics, there's a few changes we've got to make. <clears throat> One is we need the notion of fine graining and coarse graining on Hilbert space. 
Another is we need time sequences of such fine grained microstates and coarse grainings as well, because measurement processes are not equilibrium, in a state of equilibrium. Measurement process is a dynamical process. It's nothing like the quasi ergodicity that we think might be going on in the equilibrium state. No, it's nothing like that. We need time parameterization. Um, and we follow Boltzmann, and this was the key to what he did, his microstates, he chose them so they would have the same UVL measure the same size cells. And we need something like that on Hilbert space. Okay, so having said that, do not reinvent the wheel. So these things have already been done in non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics. Further, they can all be subsumed under the general framework of quasi-classical domains in the sense of Gelman and Hartle. Um, a special class and the most physically interesting and significant of the so-called decoherent history spaces or also sometimes called consistent histories approach. Okay, so that mathematical technology is flexible enough to handle almost all of non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics and indeed measurement processes to which it's been applied. Okay, and the thing that is really a clincher for me in terms of why this is such an apt framework for thinking about Everett's ideas is that a quantum history is a fine graining of Everett's concept of branch. And remember, Everett's concept of branch was actually a sequence of states. So that's really super fine grain. That's like a, a, you know, a point in classical phase space. So when I say a fine graining, I don't mean still finer. No, I mean, it's coarse graining of that, what Everett had, but it's still gonna count as fine graining in Boltzmann's sense. Okay, what Everett had is like a point in phase space. <clears throat> Okay, now I, I want to motivate this a little bit. I, mean, I don't want to go into complicated mathematics and so forth. Um, those that know it will be bored and those that don't will, will just zone out. So, so I'm going to, I want to try to characterize this as an intuitive way as I can. And let me do for that, let me just go back to Everett and the Stan Gerlach experiment, this measurement of spin. And now I'm structuring the sequence of events that's taking place. Remember those measurement protocols that I had up? I'm giving you sequentially what happens as the measurement proceeds. So initially here, we've got the uh, spin state, we've got a superposition. It leads to a superposition where the apparatus pointer is registering spin up here, and the memory has still got whatever it, it's got left in it from its old measurements. It, it, it doesn't have an array's memory function. Um, and here it's a superposition with a uh, spin state down, the apparatus pointer pointing down, the memory not yet having recorded the result. And then we go on to the next stage where whatever the pointer is pointing to is recorded in memory. Uh, and then the final stage where the pointer is reset to zero. Okay, and this is a repeatable measurement. So the spin system is left, um, you know, the spin up state, think of the projection postulate that the measured system jumps into an eigenstate of whatever has been measured. So if you measure spin up, that jumps into an eigenstate of being spin up, and then you can measure it again and you'll get the same result again. And that's what I've just got here. I've got that schematically. Do it again on the same silver atom. And now what happens when you do it again, the first three, the three steps are exactly the same as before, but now the next three steps, look at what is recorded in memory. On the one side, it's two spin ups. On the other, in the seven superposition, two spin downs. So what is recorded in memory is when you get what you get, whatever the first result is, perform the measurement again, you get the same result. That's what's being recorded in memory. But that's just what you'd get if you had applied the projection postulate. Okay, so this is a demonstration um, that quantum discontinuity, the quantum jump, can be obtained from the Schrodinger equation, but on this way of interpreting the state. And, and make that sort of clear. I, I've drawn these red lines here, and I'm talking about a vertical reading of the state. So if you look at the sequence from the vertical of the sequence on the left, it's, it's just what you would <laughs> what you would have with uh, what you expect on common sense grounds, on the backgrounds of the basic realism. It's what you'd get in a dynamical collapse theory. It's what you'd get 
phenomenologically a sequence of this form, because remember these states are states of the apparatus, as if you had state collapse taking place. <clears throat> okay, and the projection postulate. But I want you to think a bit harder about this. I mean, why did I do it that way and not in this, in this way instead? Because when I write sums of, of vectors, of course, there's no order. I can, I can reorder this in the sum. So I could have had sequences like this instead of what I had before. I've just interchanged them around. But we say, no, there's no such branch corresponding to that. Well, why not? What's going on here? With what right does Everett say there's this one story like that to be told, superposed with another story like this to be told, each of them entirely what you would expect classically or quasi-classically, and not this sort of zany one? And what that is telling us is normally what tells you you've got the same thing is you just use the degree of freedom and you just use the degree of freedom like it's a name for the silver atom. You talk about the degree of freedom of the silver atom. And in a state like this that Everett was interpreting in his way, you'd say, look, the silver atom doesn't have a state because it's in an entangled state. In an entanglement, it's the silver atom is entangled with the apparatus and you can't assign a state to the silver atom. So don't talk to me about the silver atom having definite sequence of states. And what's happening there is you are using degree of freedom as a singular term and like a proper name and what's happening in the Everett way of interpreting the state is you're giving up on that the degree of freedom is no longer sufficient it's a part of what you need to fix specify reference to give you singular reference but it's only a part also needed well also needed to the states and definite rules governing the vertical reading rules that tell you to bundle up the the state's in sequences rather than another. Uh, look, for those who know more about this stuff, let me quickly say there's something called the preferred basis problem. You've got to say what the basis is. Well, Everett's just been stipulating it. What I'm drawing attention to is maybe better called the preferred branch problem. Namely, given the basis states, how do you line them up into sequences? And what I'm saying is you need definite rules. And these rules have got to follow from the Schrodinger equation. Now, when you actually look at what Everett did in 57, those rules, he just sort of stipulated them. You know, they were just kind of the rules of the name of the game, you know, the protocols for the experiment. So that made a lot of people think that this is all really just very, you know, nothing, it's all hand waving. <clears throat> but Everett actually did much better than that. He didn't just give his measurement protocols. He gave a mechanical model, which he modeled explicitly in quantum mechanics, where the rules in question were actually a classical equation of motion for the apparatus. That was the rules that linked up the states into a sequence and made it into a branch, you know, rather than just something, uh, a, a miasma of his imagining. The rules, the classical equations had to be derived from the Schrodinger equation for this to have any substance and content, and that is what he showed. But he showed it in a longer manuscript that wasn't published for quite a long time, and it was rather ignored, so it's been a great shame. Um, something else I'd say about all of this I've got it in red at the bottom there. There are plenty of examples of similar readings of classical wave theories. So just take the example of a beam of light. So take two beams of light going in different directions. Now, would it make any sense to say uh, this is the beam of light in the superposition of two states, which doesn't make any sense? Or should we say there's two beams of light? It's exactly the same mathematics. The superposition principle applies just as well. You take the, the state of the electromagnetic field um, and you want to say that the beam of light does not have a definite state because it's not pointing in one way or the other. Or do you want to say there's two beams of light? And you can repeat this with, uh, you know, with theories of sound, you know, radio waves and so on and so forth. So we're very used to these vertical readings of the electromagnetic state or the state of a, of a linear acoustic field. Um, and we're not there tempted to think that there is a beam of light degree of freedom that could be in a superposition of two contradictory states. We don't 
use that thought. The beam of light isn't something picked out by uniquely by a degree of freedom. Of course, it's something that involves degrees of freedom, but only involves them. Okay, so I, I, I hope I've given you a, a, a sort of a, a sense of what we're looking for in this coarse graining and fine graining that we're going to borrow from Boltzmann. Um, we need those methods, okay? We need this fine graining, we need the time sequences and so forth, um, but we need this vertical reading. We need these rules and the rules and the states come together. You know, you ask, well, what is the preferred basis? It comes with the rules. Find a basis and find rules as dictated by the Schrodinger equation and you have a vertical reading of the state. If you can't find such a basis and you can't find such rules, you don't. So the name of the game is, can we find more rules and states that go with them of this form? And my basic point is that all of decoherence theory is exactly this question. Decoherence theory just is the theory of finding vertical readings to the quantum state. Let me start off with some of the, the technology. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with projection operators, I'm afraid this is going to be a bit of a, um, isn't going to work very well, but uh, hopefully you may still get something from it. So I'm starting with some parameter space D there, curly D and some coarse graining, so I'm, uh, sorry, actually that should read fine graining, tut tut. Uh, I want to correct that. <laughs> uh, fine. Um, so, uh, the, and the, these alphas, it's just parameterizing, think of little cells in the space, so parameter space D, and then define projection operators corresponding to, because these parameter space have associated quantum operators and those quantum operators has a, a spectral decomposition applies to them. Uh, we can then associate projection operators with them, which have a physical meaning. So this is how it proceeds. And with, this is often called a resolution of the identity because there's some to give the identity and they're pairwise orthogonal. Okay, <clears throat> now define chain operators as just products, not exactly of these projection operators, but of the Heisenberg picture projection operators where I straddle each projection operator first by term e to the minus i h t k, where h is the Hamiltonian, and then the result I multiply from the left by i to the h t k. Well, I'll get an intuitive understanding of what this means in a moment. The t k's, by the way, I'm also doing a, a, a coarse graining of time, a sequential treatment of fine. This is all in the name of the game is approximation, how to handle approximation. And this is a broad lesson from physics. It's not something being invented just for the Everett interpretation. Although, as I said, it's very apt for it. Anyway, here's the intuitive um, characterization of what's going on when you act on an initial state at some time zero uh, with one of these chain operators. What it does, it evolves the state initially at T0 to the time T1. It projects out onto the, this alpha with a little bar under it is a sequence of little cells in the fine graining of the Hilbert space. It projects onto the component, or I call it with property alpha one, then it unitarily evolves to time two, then projects onto the component of the state with the property alpha two, and so on, just keep going. The, the, the amplitude of the state is going down as this happens. So that's an intuitively, and I hope it can, you can sort of visualize it in a way. It's, it's precisely, a way of extracting or becomes a way of extracting a branch, a coarse grain, I mean, uh, it's, it, it's fine graining the branch. Remember my earlier comment, you know, Everett was taking the, the, the literal one dimensional projectors. I'm taking projectors with much greater dimensionality than that subspace is much greater dimensionality of that, but it's a sequence of such. And if it obeys a rule, then, sorry, if it obeys a rule, then we've got the analog of branch. Right, now, I, I think I'm just gonna put this, independent of the state Hamiltonian and partitioning, we've always got that the sum of all of these chain operators gives the identity. It, it just, just fiddle with the maths, it's just very nice and simple and it drops out. So for any state Hamiltonian and partitioning, this equation is satisfied. 
you can always represent, this is just representing the state and with respect to an arbitrary basis, but now at this multi-time basis, the, these, these what I'm calling branches, but it's a completely arbitrary branching structure. And what makes it arbitrary is that there's no rule being followed. Okay, and now here's the rule. If the state phi and the Hamiltonian H and the partitioning conspire so that this thing is zero, unless alpha satisfies some system of rules, then we've got some interesting structure. Then we've got branching of the state. We represent the state in terms of branches. Okay, so I'm just writing it in this way. The state has an interpretation in terms of branches in the sense of these rule governed sequences of states all going into a superposition. If there are equations S such that this is true, such that the state can be represented as a superposition of those rule governed sequences. Okay, now, but this is exactly the definition of a quasi-classical domain in Gelman and Hartle's terminology, which is a special class of decoherent history spaces. And it further follows that if we were looking at the sequence of subspaces of the Hilbert space, this sequence of properties, if they're distinct from one another, then the states projected out by the sequence of operations are orthogonal, so no interference, also called the consistency condition. Okay, so now that's most of the technology that we need. We can in a way revert back to our original puzzle. How do we count the number of superpositions in the state? And now we're thinking just of a single measurement, which is involving macroscopic numbers of degrees of freedom. And we've got all these large numbers of superpositions that result. So there'll be many C alphas that result. And now if we do the branch counting, what do we do? We could count the number of states which satisfy this condition. That's a natural, you know, it seems obvious and so forth, but it leads to exactly the same discontinuity as before. We know that's no good. And it's not learning from what Boltzmann did. Sorry. And worse, I mean, this is bound up with the consistency condition and the criterion for branching according to rules. All of those conditions are actually only approximate. Okay, so this, this sort of condition is, is really replicating the mistake and it's making it worse in various ways. Let me not go on about that. And it's common to both naive and local branch counting. So this is still ruling out branch counting, but we want a notion of branch number because branches of things are real. So we want them. Okay, so the desiderata looking for a branch counting rule which depends on the quantum state and is continuous in the non-topology. Okay, and we're taking over Boltzmann's ideas. So here it is. Uh, here's the coarse graining. I'm just making that explicit now. Some the fine grained, oh, I'm sorry, that should be, that should be a P subscript alpha. Sorry, these are, I, these have been swapped around, my error. But you sum the fine grained projections, you get a coarse grained one. You sum the fine grained branches, the, these chain operators, you get the coarse grained one. <clears throat> okay, so here's implementing Boltzmann's idea. Choose the fine graining so that this thing the, the, in the norm, the Hilbert space norm of the state is a constant. Okay, we, we just as in with Boltzmann, we choose the fine graining on phase space to make each fine grain cell the same volume. Now we're choosing each fine grain branch to have, as it were, the same volume, the same norm. So let n beta be the number of fine grain histories that partition beta. Remember, the sum of fine grains gives you the coarse grain thing. So long as tau is chosen sufficiently small the ratios in numbers, and similarly for beta primed, will be independent of tau. And I will see that in detail in just a moment. Here's what we have from orthogonality, a consistency. I mean, the notation is making it look more complex than it is. Think of it as just the sum of the squared norm of states, sequence of states is equal to the squared norm of the superposition, as long as all of the states are orthogonal. Okay, um, okay, now from, 
so the, the two terms on the right are just given, uh, uh, and I've got an approximate equality here now because the orthogonality is only approximate. But look what this thing is. It's a sum of all of the fine-grained histories contained within beta. But each of them has norm tor. So we're, we're summing, adding tor squared to itself how many times? Well, n alpha. Sorry, that should be a beta. Oh dear, really, I'm sorry. My slides are all over the place. n beta times tor squared therefore equals this thing. And now do the same for a sub beta primed, and you've got the ratio in the branch numbers equal to the ratio times tor squared over tor squared. The numerator is this thing. The denominator is this thing. But this is just the Born rule. Okay, and if in particular you choose beta primed as the identity, then this expression on the bottom right hand side, I think, I hope is obvious to you, is the Born rule. Okay, so this is my almost final slide. Um, we have a branch counting rule. It does agree with the Born rule. It, it didn't have to. I mean, I didn't sort of work my way backwards. I was trying to find something that was mathematically well defined in the decoherent histories formalism um, that could serve as branch number that depends on the state that is continuous in the norm topology. There's all of these questions. Is it ambiguous? Is it ad hoc? Uh, does it presuppose the Hilbert space is, is interpreted? <laughs> Uh, it, does it presuppose a prior interpretation of the Hilbert space norm in terms of probability? Is the approximation acceptable? Because there is some approximation involved. Um, the, um, this, well, I mean, I've got it in really with the orthogonality condition, but it also comes out in rounding errors. So let me just answer th these quickly and then throw it open to, con to, to questioning. Does it depend on the state? Yes. Is it continuous in the norm topology? Yes. I haven't proved it, but it's as simple to show. Is it ambiguous? Well, you don't have the conflict between local and global branch counting rule. They both are in agreement now using this new condition. Is it ad hoc? Well, it's sort of based on what Boltzmann did. So, and, and that was extremely influential and actually drove the whole of statistical mechanics for the next 20 or 30 years, including up to the discovery of quantum mechanics. So it's hard to say that this is something ad hoc. And now does it presuppose that the Hilbert space norm is interpreted in terms of probability? I don't see it. Um, I certainly never introduced an interpretation of the norm in terms of probability. I used the norm to give a discrete count of microstates, but I don't see any uh, probabilistic interpretation going on to that, but perhaps others will push it. Uh, did the decoherence theory that I developed, was that dependent on probability? I didn't interpret any step of it in terms of probability. Uh, so I, I think it's doubtful that this is a just crit critique. It did not presuppose any prior interpretation of the Hilbert space norm in terms of probability, and is approximation acceptable? Well, the one lesson that we learn if we look at macroscopic structures and macroscopic measurement devices um, is that the notion of branch that results, these history spaces and so forth, are approximately defined. Branching structure is emergent, one of David Wallace's big messages. It's emergent structure to the unit, unitarily evolving quantum state. And now what this is showing is that probability is something objective out there, namely ratios and branch numbers. Um, but those branches being emergent, so are these probabilities. Probability, physical probability is something emergent. It only arises insofar as macroscopic branching arises. There's no reason or rationale to suggest that it goes down deeper, it goes down to the microscopic level. <clears throat> Um, I think, and I think that's pretty well me done, right? So thank you all. Um, sorry if I've gone on a little long. Um, um, I guess I had too much material, but apologies for that. No problem. And thank you, Professor Simon, for the wonderful and thought-provoking talk.
we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Let me read the questions to you. So Paolo asks, prior to branching, do we have an infinite set of fungible states or it doesn't matter how many and we can only really talk about one state? Um, fungible states, well, can you say a bit more about what that means? I think what he means is that can you have in, in infinite number of in, 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 uh, states which cannot be distinguished uh, before branching? Or do we only talk about uh, one state and start from there? I well, I, 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 I think, to remember, this is a realist in interpretation. So if you're talking about a real measurement context and a measurement device, you've got a state preparation device, which is described in, um, uh, it's got microscopic structure. Now, one can describe that in terms of quantum mechanics and the Schrodinger equation and unitarily evolve the state it produces, that state preparation device will be whatever it is. Human ingenuity, we can build many, many different state preparation devices. So if the question is, is there any limit to the variety of state preparation devices that we can build? I guess not, but it's not going to be an infinite number. We, we only have finite competences here. Now, if the question is more, you know, well, what's happening in the physical world? Forget about measuring processes altogether. Uh, that's absolutely the right question to pose from the point of view of realism. And the answer is, well, let, let's get real, you know, are you talking about a solid, a gas? Um, are we talking about maybe a metastable combination of both? Um, are we, how many degrees of freedom are we talking about? What sort of environment? Is it thermal? It's bound to be thermal. What is the thermal environment? You know, you've got to get serious about modeling the, the sort of physical reality. Ah, yeah, I seem to have lost screen, which is yes, I, I, I have I have removed the uh, okay. screen share. Anyway, okay, so, so there are so, a couple of more questions. Uh, yeah, go. Should... Okay, so uh, you talked about uh, David Wallace's book, uh, The Emergent Universe. Uh, would you also recommend uh, Sean Carroll's book, Something Deeply Hidden? Oh yes, sure. But I mean, Sean's book is lovely, but it's it, it's it's a popular book. Um, David's book is a serious book. I, I, what I mean by that is it, it's 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 a landmark book. It it's doing things that have never been done before. I mean, he published half a dozen papers relating to the material there, um, but none in the sort of detail provided in the book. Um, uh, I mean, the book is is a landmark. I have no other is is there a, is there is there a popular version of uh, David's book? No, <laughs> well, <Okay>. Sean's, <laughs> you know, but no, <laughs> no, no, I'm afraid not. Um, that doesn't mean that David's book is not readable to the non-expert, at least the first couple of chapters are. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, chapter four has got some fairly introductory things in it that are readable to non-experts. Um, but the subsequent material on the quantum decision theory in particular gets fairly technically demanding. Mm -hmm. and, and chapter three on decoherence theory um, it sketches various results. It's it's not demanding if you just take it, uh, for, just believe what he tells you. But if you're trying to figure out what he's telling you and whether what it really means, you need to go into decoherence theory in a bit more detail. Um, there isn't really a good popular introduction to decoherence theory that I know of, which is surprising to be honest. But mm -hmm. there's a couple of excellent books. Um, I mean, here's one of them one of the modern um, classics really by Yaus and others, uh, Zay, Kiefer, Giulini, Kupsch, uh, Stamanatescu. These are all, you know, serious people in decoherence theory. Some of them really created decoherence theory. So that's a good book. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next question is about uh, experimental support. Can quantum computation provide an experiment that can uh, prove the many worlds interpretation or is it just a metaphysical debate about interpretation? It, it's, 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 it's a realist interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, I mean, I don't think that's just metaphysics. It's making sense of quantum mechanics in terms of a real existent entities. Um, I, I didn't see anything metaphysical about that. Uh, if you wish to understand complex quantum systems um, in terms of existent physical entities, um, I know of no other way to do it, unless it's a hidden variable theory. Even if you go to dynamical collapse, if you're looking at 
um, microscopic systems, the structure is pretty well what you've got with the Everett interpretation. I mean, you might want to privilege something like mass density. You can calculate mass densities for given states and say, oh, that's the special reality. So some people in dynamical collapse theories do that, but on the Everett interpretation, there's no particular reason to. But on the general question of how do you prove or disprove the Everett interpretation, well, it's just quantum mechanics realistically uh, interpreted, assuming universality of the Schrodinger equation. All you have to do is show the breakdown of the Schrodinger equation, and then you've got it, this proof of many worlds. And, and quantum computing is, is a good pushing the boundary stuff, you know, which is why it's excellent. And nanotechnology is doing the same. We're pushing this boundary all the time. We are seeing coherence effects, superposition effects, the superposition principle being measurable, detectable for more and more massive systems. And as long as that keeps going, <laughs> um, Everett interpretation with standard quantum mechanics will be vindicated or you know, continue not to be defeated come the day where we find an experimental disproof, then both standard quantum mechanics and the Everett interpretation will, will be ended. Hmm. The next question is about history. Uh, do you think that if modern entanglement measurements were available during the 1930s, uh, there would be a consensus on Copenhagen interpretation or uh, maybe the pilot wave theory would, you know, have, have been, have had a different history, you know? <clears throat> how it has been treated. I, I think on the specifics of whether, had there been um, a greater understanding of entanglement in the 30s, I, I think it would have told against the Copenhagen interpretation, to be honest, because the Copenhagen interpretation was very resistant to interpreting the mathematics. You know, the Copenhagen interpretation, certainly Bohr, was all about interpreting experiments rather than coming to groups with the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics and entanglement is all about the latter. So I don't think it would have played well for Copenhagen. Whether it would have played well for hidden variables would have depended on how fruitful hidden variable theory would have been to exploring issues involving entanglement. Now we're doing that all the time in something like quantum computing and quantum information theory. So is it or isn't it? You guys tell me. Is pilot wave theory hidden Bohmian mechanics, is it a fruitful tool for exploring the quantum mechanics of information? Over to you, really. I, I, want you, I want to hear your answers to that question. And if it is, may I say, then power to the pilot wave theory. You know, good for it if, if, if it turns out it's fruitful and useful. I, 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 from what I understand, it, it, it hasn't shown itself to be fruitful or useful. And that's part of the reason why I don't work in that field. You know, come the day when it is and it does, then I'll be much, much more interested in it. Mm -hmm. okay, I mean, so, may uh... I just say, just, just a quick add addition, the one area in which I think there has been quite a lot of discussion and some claims, and there's probably something to it, is that pilot wave theory uh, is quite good on transit times. There's certain sorts of questions bound up with things like quantum tunneling and so forth, where um, hidden variable theory kind of gives you a definite, precise answer. The trouble is you can't actually measure it. But, you know, and there I wonder whether it isn't giving you a metaphysics rather than something physical because you can't measure it yeah sorry you had another question yeah uh, what are the main what are the main arguments against the many worlds interpretation a critic would make today in 20, 2021 well i think the main one is um that branch counting doesn't work um and there's no other coherent interpretation of physical probability and all you've got uh, the quantum decision theory stuff and the quantum decision theory is utterly uninformative and not explanatory of how come we see the statistics that we do. You know, what, because a rational agent will bet on them? I mean, that's an insane explanation of how come we see the statistics that we do. So there's something sort of seriously failing in the decision theory approach vis-a-vis -vis explaining the statistics. And this has been a major criticism of the deutsch wallace representation theorem. I think, you know, there's a lot to that, which is why what I've just done and gone through, if it's right, answers and addresses and responds to that criticism, and I refuse it. I'm not sure of any other major criticism other than the incredibility of the whole thing. I mean, it's interesting. If you speak to some people, they work mostly in quantum field theory, you know, they'll say, well, what's all this about the Schrodinger equation? Use path integrals, you know, as though that solves the measurement problem or that just there's lots of ways of sort of rejecting um, ways forward in foundations, but the point is to take the simplest formalism that we've got and show and make sense of it. 
Uh, so it's, that's the, I mean, one can re sort of repeat a lot of these arguments at the level of path integral theory. And mm -hmm. one can revisit a lot of these issues in terms of quantum field theory if you want to. It adds complexity without actually helping for physical intuition or insight. Um, anyway, sorry. Okay, so there's a follow up question. Uh, so are, are these uh, uh, are these attacks on uh, many worlds interpretation uh, resolved with other interpretations like the relational interpretation or cubism? Well, I, I've been saying right from the beginning that um, I'm concerned with realist interpretations of quantum mechanics in which the quantum state represents some physical reality um, and further obeys some definite set of laws which you know, hold always, you know, in the way of Einstein's equations in gravity or uh, Maxwell's equations. We don't think these equations are suddenly suspended because people make experiments or something like that. So realism, as I understand it, and I've, as I've been speaking about it, both that the state represents something real and the Schrodinger equation to be specific is an exceptionless law. Now, neither the relational interpretation nor cubism does that. Um, neither accepts or embraces the idea that the quantum state represents physical reality. So they're just not realist in my sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, here's a question from my side. Uh, so there are people who have a very operational approach to quantum mechanics and, you know, they make use of entanglement and all those, you know, uh, peculiar features of quantum mechanics. Uh, why, what motivates you to work in the interpretations of quantum mechanics? Why, What's the use why, of it? What's the use it? of, yeah. Well, well <laughs> I mean, I think, um, are you interested in, I mean, it's an intellectual project all on its own to, as it were, try to do physics as nothing but operational stuff. Everything must be operationally defined and physics is entirely about those operationally defined quantities and the measurement of those operationally defined quantities. And if that's your take on what physics is, then you won't see much interest in realism. Um, realism kicks in when you start to take the physics and the equations seriously as representing some sort of reality. Now, you could be an operationalist about cosmology. You could say, you know, all of these quasars and black holes and all of these sorts of things, they're just operationally defined in terms of various kinds of experiments that we can perform. And the physics is just a matter of getting the predictions right on all those sorts of experiments that we perform. And don't talk to me about there being billions of galaxies out there in the universe. I'm not interested in that sort of nonsense. I'm just interested in what is operationally defined and what I can calculate and measure. Sure. I mean, it's a free, it's a free world. People can do what they like to do here and find what they like to find interesting. But I suggest there's a big sector that is really, really interested in the question of is the universe made out of billions of galaxies or not? Is it actually 14 billion years old or not? You know, for many, many people, these are important questions. And don't forget, our entire evidence for modern cosmology is based on the tiniest of electromagnetic vibrations that we detect here on planet Earth. Yeah. That's it. We've got nothing else to go. We've got some meteorites, you know. And well, now we're doing a bit of space travel. We, you know, we get a bit more. But these tiniest of vibrations in the electromagnetic field, that is our entire basis our entire knowledge of cosmology. Right, that's yeah. a salutary thought. Of course, we could shrug our shoulders and say, oh, who cares about those tiny vibrations? You know, it's all a lot of nonsense. Sure, you can always take that view, um, but I don't think many physicists will join you with it. Hmm. Okay, so one last question. Uh, do you think uh, Averettian quantum mechanics marries one to wave function realism? And if not, how do structures and worlds actually arise from just the time evolution of quantum state? Well, my whole talk has been about that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've tried to show how, I mean, I didn't actually write down the interaction of Hamiltonian for the, for the um, uh, stern gerlach experiment and so forth and show the coupling with the magnetic field and how you get the correlation of the momentum of the silver atom depending on the spin state. And, and you know, I, I, the, I mean, that, just go through those details and you see Everett's model in detail. 
And that's typical of many other measurement interactions. Of course, there are some interesting measurement processes that don't fit into that mold. And, and you know, there's lots and lots and lots of work and questions to be answered about that kind of stuff. But for a simple examples, just look at the Stone Gerlach experiment, and that's where you see the splitting of worlds. But as my talk showed, I hope it's not just a splitting into two, it's a splitting into large, vast numbers vast number with a spin up result, a vast number with a spin down result. Hmm. <clears throat> All right, I think uh, it's time to end our session. Thank you so much, uh, Simon, for joining us and giving us such a fascinating and thought provoking talk. Uh, okay. I would like to request our viewers to uh, check out our Facebook page. Uh, there is another talk this week uh, by Dr. Ross Duncan who will be talking about ZX calculus, which is a diagrammatic approach for you uh, that can be used in quantum information research and quantum computing. Uh, see you on Thursday then. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been most enjoyable and uh, very good questions. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>